Welcome, welcome everyone. So good to be here. Uh, time just scooting by so fast trying to get from Lindsay to here. I finished my sermon. I thought in good time there and I thought, oh, I, I got plenty of time, but I tell you, it just races away. Um, we're going to do something a little different for our welcome this morning. I didn't know where to put this in, but uh, most of you are probably aware we're in the process of the nominating committee working and, and seeking to fill ministry uh, positions uh, in the church, in the community. And so I just wanted to share a little something with you this morning, uh, given that that's going on. And so here we go. Let's see if I can remember how to make this work. Okay, there we go. I've uh, titled this just for the sake of a title, Not Normal, The Adventure of Volunteering. The implication is that often in our lives, normal is not volunteering, but this is an appeal uh, to engage in the adventure of volunteering. Let's see what we can learn. Where do you get started? We want our lives to count. I think all of us could agree with that. Uh, it's important to us that our lives count. We want our lives to count, and then we get busy. Hmm, a dilemma. I want my life to count, but before I know it, uh, it it's full of so much that uh, I don't think I have any time to maybe do those other things. We become busy with our own lives. We become comfortable, focused on our own needs and interests. We become comfortable with our current routines. And the others all disappear from our personal and mental framework. We've all been there. It, it happens so easily. It's just kind of the nature of things. But God knew... Here's the important principle. God knew that if we only focus on our own interest, we become selfish. Selfish, we become selfish individuals who hold on to material stuff way too tightly. An inward, insular focus leads to emptiness and selfishness. So God knew these things. And so, actually, here, let me see. He knew that. And so God, of course, appeals to us, uh, calls to us to engage, engage with others. This, hence the whole idea of volunteering, of becoming not normal. Now, if we look at volunteer uh, statistics, it's actually quite impressive and, and a blessing. The Calvinists would say this is an example of God's common grace that even people who aren't even Christians engage in volunteer activities. They, they give to others. 
So if you look at the number of Americans that volunteered, and this was from a census done in 2018, the number of Americans that gave volunteer time to help others was 63 million Americans, roughly 20 25% of the population. The number of volunteer hours accumulated in that year was 8 billion. So 8 billion hours given to help others without being paid and the monetary value of those hours volunteered is figured in at $203.4 billion. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So uh, it's, it's evident that quite a few have taken the plunge, that quite a few have broken out of that tendency to just get completely occupied with my own interest and my own needs and, and to forget about the others. Quite a few have broken through that and they're out there seeing the needs of others, engaging with the needs of others. So we wonder what, what compels them? What compels someone to take these kinds of steps? First of all, a sense of significance. You feel good when you've acted on behalf of another, when you've done something for another. It gives a sense of significance. There's an experience of fulfillment. There's the realization of purpose and meaning. Huh, I did something that, that had real meaning. Um, was that all three? Okay, that's, that's all I had there. So, but, but even beyond that, there's a deeper reason, isn't there? a deeper reason that compels us to volunteer and to give in these kinds of ways. Number one, we were created to love. We were created to love others. We were created to give. We were created to care. And we were created to help others. This is how God made us. And so that's the deeper reason for finding ways Apart from my usual routine, we all know that we have jobs and they occupy a, a significant percentage of our time. Um, not all of us have jobs, some are retired, but then there's still other things we get busy with. We all know those things, but we can find ways to give, to show care, to love. We can find ways to volunteer. And in actual fact, the Christian church, the community we belong to, cannot survive without volunteers, without willing, committed people who say, I want to contribute in these ways. I want to add significance. Um, I want to love and care and give. Without that kind of action within the community, very little can actually happen. You know, especially within Adventism, we don't have large pastoral staffs. We have, you know, one pastor typically. Um, we're absolutely dependent on volunteer commitment. So what holds us back? What makes us uh, kind of cringe when the person on the nominating committee calls and we think, oh no, what are they going to ask me to do? We, we want to change that. We, we want to change that culture so that when they call, we're like, what is God inviting me to? And, you know, you may say no to this, but if you say no to what they're asking you, Ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what do you want me to do in the community? You know, don't just say no, no. Say no so you can say yes to something else. So what then holds us back from this kind of volunteer engagement? Sometimes we look at the needs. You look at the needs just in Porterville. They are overwhelming. You start looking at society. You start looking around you. The needs are overwhelming. That can hold us back. Sometimes we think, well, there's just too many needs out there and, and we, we don't know where to start because some of us can't figure out how to do everything. Some of us don't do anything. That's amazing how it's so easy to do that. Well, I can't figure out how to do everything, so then I don't do anything. We settle for what is normal. But there's actually tremendous benefits from volunteering. Just move through them quickly here. There's a deeper fulfillment that comes with giving rather than getting. There's more personal value that comes from doing something lasting in this world. 
Do you know that every act done in faith and service and love to another will be eternal? An act done in faith cannot be lost. It's an incredible idea. Think about it. Uh, there's a better outlook comes when you view your struggles in the light of those you're trying to help. It, it brings a perspective when you see that others have much bigger problems than you. You're not so inclined to get mired down in, in your own self-pity. And so that's an important element. And then incredible joy surfaces when you get to see someone else soar because of your efforts on their behalf. These are some of the benefits. So these things only come when we partner with God to take care of the people he loves. We just have to start helping someone else. We don't have to worry about trying to do everything for everyone in order to make a difference in this world. That's his job, not ours. Whew, don't you feel better? You don't have to carry the world on your back. But take a deep breath and then exhale. All you have to do is just start somewhere. So the nominating committee is engaged and we are moving very prayerfully. We're not just sitting down with a list of your names and trying to plug people into slots. We're spending time on our knees saying, God, who are you calling for this? Who are you calling for that? We, we ask you to be just as prayerful, and we're not going to call and say, will you do this? I want the answer right now. We're going to call and say, will you consider this? Will you go to God in prayer and ask him if he's asking you to do this? So let's move forward on our knees. I'm excited that God is uh, moving in significant ways in our midst, and don't be afraid to start somewhere. Thus move into worship. You guys uh, give us some music and just some quiet meditation. We're entering the presence of God consciously with intent and thus bow in his presence as we prepare to, to worship him. Oh, Lord God, thank you for the immense privilege of being drawn into your presence under the shadow of your cross and in the light of your resurrection, your work for us in heaven. We come as sinners who are being redeemed, and we look to you. We, we pray that as we seek you in this place together, that you will meet us and that we will know your blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. We have the privilege of singing hymns to our wonderful God this morning. Will you join us as we 
sing praises, and we thank all of our musicians over here for playing for us this morning, too. Thank you. Our first hymn is Marvelous Grace, and we are so fortunate to have the grace of God in our lives. next song is redeemed redeemed how we love to proclaim it sing because he lives. Still, the 
come assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives like a face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because i know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and now would you stand with me as we sing holy 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 be seated. Happy Sabbath. Our scripture today is Psalms 32. I'll be reading from the NASB. How blessed is he whose wrongdoing is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is a person whose guilt the Lord does not take into account, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality failed as with the dry heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my guilt. I said, I will confess my wrongdoings to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Certainly in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You keep me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will advise you with my eye upon you. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near you. 
The sorrows of the wicked are many, but the one who trusts in the Lord, goodness will surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Good morning, everyone. Glad you're here. Um, does anybody have a special request today for God? Silent request? Let's show it by raising our hands. And any praises? Two hands? <laughs> God has blessed us so much. We had a miracle deliverance last night of our kids on their way up. Just amazing how God works. And um, ask Julie and Kevin about that. <laughs> anyway, well, uh, all who are able, let's kneel together and pray. Dear Father, you're above us all, but you are so near to us. We need you very, very much. We need your spirit in our hearts. So we'll have your love for others, a strong love that really cares about others. Please help us. And thank you so much for your blessings, for your care for us, for blessing us every day. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, it's time for our children to come up, both of you. John, Penny, we, oh yes, good. Welcome, Trinity.
So children, as you're coming up, remember to ask your parents to take you to Vespers tonight at 5.30, right? John, Raul, 5.30, here. Vespers, right, Trent? Trip, come on, man. Yeah, I'm having a story <laughs> for you, bud. Okay, children, this morning I want to teach you a game, okay? It's a game. And you can play this with, do any of you have friends in the neighborhood that come over to your house to play? But you have friends at school. Okay, so you have friends. So teach them this game. This game is called Bob. Hi, Aubrey. <laughs> so... Uh, it's hard to be a grandpa and tell these stories. So I have a, this is how the game goes. I'm gonna call this guy Bob, and as soon as you know Bob's real name, you tell me, okay? So Bob knew God, and God knew Bob. And God had a project for Bob. And, he, and God told Bob to go to a place. Well, Bob didn't want to go. So Bob got on a ship. Yes, Ava? But the ship ride didn't go well. So Bob caught a ride on a fish. Yes? Noah. You're close. Yeah. Jonah. Right, Bob's real name is Jonah. Good, good. I have one more. Bob was going to leave the house in the morning and he needed to eat something because he thought it was going to be a long day. So Bob packed a lunch and he took his lunch with him and he heard a man talking and the man was very interesting. So Bob sat down on the grass and listened to a man named Jesus and Jesus talked all day and it got really late. And Bob was thinking of eating his lunch when one of Jesus' friends came up and asked him for his lunch. Yes, Trip. It was the kid, and it was and it was the it was the story of how how Jesus made made one meal into twelve baskets of food. You're right. You're right. So now, when you think of your Bible stories, you can tell them to your friends, but first, tell them his name is Bob, and then see how long it takes him to guess Bob's real name. You can do that, can't you? All right. You can get those stories out of your Sabbath school lesson, you know. All right, you can go back to your seats. This is just more fun. I'm glad you're here, too. <clears throat> yeah, it's a real treat to have Julie and Kevin with us and Aubrey and Millie. <clears throat> so just like running a household, we're here today to remember our local church budget. And we know it can use help, and it's so good to see each of you here. And we're going to give from our hearts. Will the deacons please stand? Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for letting us contribute to your work to show what it means, to tell what it means to us to have your love, your peace, your strength, and to share that with others through our church. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Do you like to just stand here? Or would you like to go to the podium? Stand here. Thank you, Bob, Steve, and Carol. Uh, tremendous message in that song. Um, I can't help but just take a little time here in the beginning of uh, things to share with you a little bit about my morning. It ties into this song that they just did. I uh, woke up early, quite early, and uh, looked on my phone to see if there were any messages from our girls. It's always something I check, and I type them out each a, me each a message. They're all off at college. But then I looked at my uh, email, and I receive a magazine called Salvo. 
and Salvo is a uh, magazine done by Christians, and they, they engage with and critique a lot of different things that are going on in the wider culture around us. And I was deeply stirred this morning. There was a whole series of short blog articles on uh, Facebook's uh, renaming venture. They're now called Meta, or soon will be called Meta, which is short for Metaverse, Meta Universe. And they are aiming at taking this whole technology thing to a whole new level, which will allow you to create your own worlds and actually experience them. This is deeply dangerous spiritually because it is placing mankind in the place of God with capacities not like God's, of course, but that attempt to mimic God's capacities. And it will be deeply, deeply destructive to the human race. You think that the media, the social media, the phones, the Twitter, the TikTok have been hard enough on our kids. The games have been hard enough on our kids and destructive to the present generation. The next step of technology will devour them alive. And as I read these articles, I just realized Ellen White talked over a hundred years ago about a tide of evil getting ready to break on the world that could hardly be comprehended. Folks, we are right in the teeth of that. The tsunami wave is curling and is about ready to break on our heads. And I only say these things because under his wings, it's, it's time to engage in community as church like we've never engaged before. It's time to pray for each other like we've never prayed before. It's time to sink our roots deep into the Word like we've never sunk them before. God is well able to, to secure all of us to Himself, but it's time to draw close. It's time to press into His presence eagerly. I maybe should quit before I say too much. I long for the day when all of us press into prayer meeting eager to feed on His Word and pray for each other. I long for the day when we can be like the Baptist who I, every weekend have three meetings and they're there, every single one of them, there in every one of those meetings, hungry for the Word of God, pressing into God's presence. And simply opening my heart to you, it's time. It's time to press close. It's time to, to come close to each other because the evil that is now breaking upon this planet will be completely unparalleled. God, of course, is able, but we want to come close to Him and receive the fullness of His Spirit so that we can stand in this time that is coming as bright lights in the darkness. So... Just a little bit of extra on the front end. I didn't plan to say these things, but uh, just wanted to put that in. Let's pray, and then I'll begin my prepared remarks. Lord Jesus, you are our refuge, and your wings are perfect. To take refuge there, there is nothing better. Lord, we don't always know how to find our, our way there. We stumble and we stray. We struggle with our hearts, but you are compassionate and gracious. Lord, draw us close to you. Do all that you are well able to do. And I pray that as we, as we look into your word this morning, that you will use it in your grace and your mercy to speak to us and to touch us and to encourage us and build us up. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been working on this passage in Romans. And if you haven't figured it out already, I have this tendency. I don't just preach here for a Sabbath or two and then on to some other place. I want to build the insight, the spiritual insight of the saints so that we, that we come back. I, I, I want to make it so that when you come back to this passage later, you don't feel lost or, or half assured about what it's saying. You say, I know what it's saying. This is what it speaks to me. This is what it's doing for me. This is what it's done for me. And so I, I apologize, but I don't really. 
for spending, for, for moving this slowly through the passage because we really want to own it. We want to make it our own. So we've been working through this passage in Romans, the first few chapters, and the reason is is because often we have grasped the gospel with our heads, but it hasn't made its way down into our hearts. I don't care who you are and how long you've been a Christian and, and how bright your sense of gospel understanding at one time or another may have been, it's, it's just the nature and the tendency of our experience in the world that, that it can grow dim and, and we can find ourselves off attempting other, uh, other ways to find the peace and courage we need and, and sometimes that connection between what we know in our heads and what we live in our hearts gets uh, muddied or broken or, or even uh, kind of stopped up. And so we've been spending this time here because when the gospel is not fresh and ever present in our hearts and minds, it inevitably put produces problems in the spiritual life. Lose sight of that gospel beacon, and in some way or another, you're going to have, start having some kind of spiritual problem. It may be weakness and spiritual failure, falling into sin. It may be a lack of joy, you kind of become a soldier who slogs along, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but there's no joy. Or you lose a contagious witness that just flows out of you and, and you can't wait to tell other people, that goes away. Or you may lack love. Your, your heart you know you should love, but, but that strength of love and, and that energy of love that comes from God it seems to be lacking. All of that can happen when when the gospel becomes just a little bit blurry, uh, not so much in our heads, but in our hearts, and, and we begin to lose the, the tremendous message of the gospel. Now, Satan loves this. And in fact, that's one reason we have such a hard time holding on to insight that may have even been once gained. It's hard enough to gain the initial gospel insight that sets the heart to singing. It can be hard to gain that. But then having gained it, he, he loves to come in and work this angle and work that angle, and before we know it, we're no longer singing because he's obscured that gospel insight once again. And so he's constantly working very hard to keep us from tasting and experiencing the full power of the gospel. And, and that's what we're seeking, though, isn't it? We want that full power of the gospel. We don't want to live in the shallows. We want to live in the depths and, and to know the strength of who God is for us and what he's done for us and what he's doing for us. And so that's what we're seeking. That's what we're looking for. One way of expressing it is the book of Hebrews. If you read through it, it talks about this confidence this strong confidence that, that nothing can shake. I looked up the word there, and it's, it's used four times, this word confidence in Hebrews. And I looked it up, and, and here was the definition given in the uh, dictionary for the Greek language. It says this word means free and fearless confidence. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Don't you long for that? Free and fearless confidence. No, we're not done yet. It also means cheerful courage. Cheerful courage. And then it also means boldness and assurance. What a rich word, isn't it? That's what the gospel gives us when it is shining brightly in our, in our eyes, in the eyes of our heart, free and fearless confidence, cheerful courage, boldness and assurance. That's what the Lord intends us to have. Oh, but so often we get mired down, we lose sight, and, and we lose this kind of confidence. Uh, then we can also find it in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, this, this may surprise you a little bit, but in the book of Romans, what I believe is the equivalent to this word of confidence, it's the word justified. Justified. Oh, there we have it in, in our verse, the verse I'm seeking to work off of today. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, is Romans 3, verse 23. But then verse 24, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. It's that experience of being justified. 
It's that experience that makes me free and fearless in my confidence, that uh, gives me cheerful courage and boldness assurance, bold boldness and assurance. And so we find it in Romans under this word justified. And when one really comes to understand what is implied, what is involved in this word justified, all of that comes in, the free and fearless confidence, the cheerful courage, the boldness and assurance, it all wells up in the heart and becomes known in the life. It's a clear grasp of the biblical meaning of this word justified that is the very foundation of a strong Christian life. Now it's clear that that's what Paul is seeking to establish here. He's seeking to preach to people, to work with people. They're actually already Christians, but he wants to, he wants to know that this foundation is really firmly laid so that, it, so that they don't get knocked off, off track and they don't get discouraged and they don't end up in shallows and miseries. No, he wants them to have this confidence and this experience of, I have been justified by grace. He wants them to know that, and, and that's what he's seeking to establish. His whole argument, right from chapter 1, verse 18, as he begins to preach his sermon, his whole argument is aimed at that. He wants them to be free in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's also clear that Paul's whole burden is to see us freed from the power of sin. That's what the gospel is aiming at. We, we have been slaves. We have been in bondage. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He wants to get us free from that. And his way of getting us free from that is telling us what God has done for us. So it's obviously not just Paul's burden. It's God's burden as well. Paul is simply standing in for God and trying to make clear to us what it is that God has done on our behalf. Now, we've also seen in weeks past, this reminding us of the framework of our experience, what it's like for us. We've also seen in weeks past that the first step in being made free is that of coming to a strong and clear conviction of just how enslaved we have been. If you don't know that you've been enslaved to sin, if you haven't felt the battle and the struggle in your soul, that, that if you haven't realized there's a bent in me towards doing the wrong thing, not the right thing, if you haven't felt that, the gospel won't mean very much to you. You, you may not feel you really need it. Oh, yeah, it's nice to know God is merciful, but, but no, if you have come under Holy Spirit conviction of your sinfulness and your need, the gospel is everything to you. It's everything to you because you become clear, unless he has moved for me, I am lost. There is no hope whatsoever, but thank God he has moved. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. And so here we are standing in the place of Romans 3.19. You remember we go back to that verse? Remember what that's like there, that place? We've been silenced. Our mouths are closed. We can't make any more excuses for our sin. We can't justify our sin. We can't explain it away. We're simply guilty as charged and deserve eternal judgment. That's the Romans 3.19 place. And, and so there we are, we're standing there and under the conviction of spirit and it's not just a pious platitude that we deserve judgment but a deeply held conviction. We know it in the depths of our soul. We have been that wrong. Now that's not an easy place to be in, is it? It's not a comfortable place to, to face how wrong I have been. It's not comfortable at all but it is a great step towards freedom because freedom always begins with a frank acknowledgement of where I am actually at in terms of my need. Oh, but here we, then, here we are then, and, and, and now if we're standing in that place, we are burdened with a sense of our sinfulness. 
burdened with the consciousness of our failings. What does, what does God do for us when we have been brought to that place? What does He do for us? He justifies us. By sheer grace and mercy. We don't lift a finger. We don't do a thing to move to a better place. We are helpless in our sin and our ungodliness. Hearts set against him. There we are, completely helpless. What does he do for us there? He justifies us. Well, what does this mean? He justifies us. We've read it already. I'll read it again. All have sinned. But then the next phrase down in 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. What does it mean that he has justified us? Well, justification has two components. There's, there's two elements to this idea of justification that are absolutely essential for us to grasp. The first is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Have you, ever, have you ever failed a friend and sinned against them or a family member and you're deeply burdened by that failure? You feel it and you feel the fracture that it's made in the relationship. What is it that you need at that moment? You need forgiveness. Without forgiveness, the relationship is done. You need forgiveness, and, and this is how it is with God. Justification, one central element, element of it is, is God forgives us. He forgives us our sin. But not only that, and that, the, the forgiveness, that's why I had Jenica read Psalms 32 this morning. You can go back there and spend more time with it. Powerful, beautiful psalm. But it's not only forgiveness that is involved in justification. If we only think of forgiveness, we've missed a really vital element of it because the other thing that is involved in justification is He gives us, by sheer grace, He gives us a particular standing before Him. You say, well, what do you mean, Pastor? What, what do you mean a particular standing? What standing does He give me? I'll tell you what He does for you. Listen to this. It's from, uh, let's see, what's uh, Faith in Works, a little book uh, that they put together from, from Ellen White's writings. Listen to what she says. We stand in favor before God not because of any merit in ourselves. We stand in favor not because of any merit in ourselves but because of our faith in the Lord our righteousness. It's amazing, isn't it? Oh, listen, here's another quote, and I forgot to write down where it's from. But another quote uh, from Ellen White. In Christ, in Christ, the sinner stands. Huh, these, it's amazing how these words, you say they don't fit together, but they do in the grace of God. Listen, in Christ, the sinner stands guiltless, guiltless before the law. It's It's astounding. We're talking about the person in that Romans 3.19 place. There they are. They're standing. They're saying, I deserve nothing but judgment. I am full of sin. I've been so wrong, God. I've acted against you. I've disobeyed you. I've pushed back against you. I haven't trusted you over and over. My life is stained. But God says, did you put your faith in my son, Jesus Christ? You say, well, yes, Lord. He says, you're guiltless. I see none of what you just described. You stand guiltless. Read it again. In Christ the sinner stands guiltless before the law. It's astounding. We can hardly comprehend it. But this is what he does for us. One more quote. If you believe in Christ as your Savior, his perfect obedience is set to your account. But then we read that and we're tempted to protest. There's something in us that is tempted to protest. We, we're tempted to say, what kind of spiritual abracadabra is this? What kind of spiritual abracadabra? That one, you know, what you're telling me is that one who is obviously stained and deeply corrupted by sin is all of a sudden pronounced righteous? How, how can this be? 
And, 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 and somehow the logic, we, we can't figure out how does this logic work. It, it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't even seem just, does it? I mean, after all, this is a sinner. How, how, how can you call him righteous? How, how, can he stand, how can he stand guiltless before the law? He's broken that law right and left. How can you do this? And it feels almost like hocus pocus. And some, there's a rising voice within the culture that it is saying, oh, that Christian idea of, of substitution, of one standing in for the other, oh, that, that's, not, that's not even just. That's not justice. How can I suffer for your sins? And they're trying to tell us that, that this is a hocus pocus idea, that, that it doesn't work in the, in the logical world, in the real world. Well, thank God it works in God's world. Thank God it works in God's world. But now in a certain sense, they're on to something. We instinctively feel, don't we, that sin cannot just be waved away and swept under the rug. What if someone at work had sinned grievously against you? And the, the boss over you says, oh, they're forgiven. Are you going to be happy with that? You know, there, there, there's, there's things involved in this picture and we say, wait a minute, more than that has to be happening. You know, the sin thing has to be taken seriously. And uh, we know that you can't just sweep under the rug. You, you can't just say abracadabra and it's all gone. Sin is a serious, a serious thing. And it has roots and tentacles and, and how are you going to get rid of it? You, you just pronounce forgiveness and it's done? You know, what's, what's happening here? I want to put this in very practical terms. I'm shifting a little bit from what I just said, but I want to put this in very practical terms because this is the most important part of what I'm trying to say today, and that's this way. The question really is, I'm going to put it in personal terms, how do I come to freedom from the sense of sin's burden in my life? How do I come to that? How, do, how am I set free from the burden of shame and guilt? How can I possibly know freedom from this? I don't know about you, but assuming you're human, uh, I, you probably have had an experience very like I have had. I can go back through the memories in my mind and, and I can remember my faults and failings. They don't just go away. They're, they're there, and, and, and Satan loves to bring them in and press them in upon you and try to break your courage and, and, and break you down and discourage you. And uh, Martin Luther talks about this. He says, Satan comes and he says, you're a great sinner. What hope could you possibly have? And so this can be a challenge for us. We've grasped the gospel. We've understood it, and yet, and yet it can be difficult it can be difficult to shake this sense of, well, no, I, I've been so, so wrong here and there and in that other instance, and how can I possibly be clean? How can I believe? How can I stand before the Lord knowing that I'm fully acquitted, that he sees me as guiltless? How can I know this? That's the question. And we know that it requires a very real answer. We know that sin must be dealt with in terms as real as the problem itself. There's no just abracadabra, oh, all gone, all fixed. No, no, no. Sin has to be dealt with in terms just as real as the problem itself. Let me read to you a quote from Martin Luther. Luther knew very well about these battles, about these things. So he says this. He says, we can know the gospel, but in actual living, however, it is not so easy to persuade oneself that by grace alone, in opposition to every other means, we obtain the forgiveness of our sins and peace with God. 
Not so easy in actual life. You see what Luther's saying? He's saying it's very easy to think, well, that's not really sufficient. Um, I got to do something, don't I? I, I, I better get to work. I got to do something. You know what happens if we fall into that I've got to do something? We end up back in a place where we feel like we're on the outside trying to work our way into the inside and it never, never works. And if you think it's working, you probably have a huge burden of sinful pride riding right on your back. It never works. We cannot work ourselves into the place of freedom and forgiveness and peace and grace with God. We just can't do it. It's all of grace. It really is. But in actual experience, it can be so hard to get a hold of that in a way that it rings true and goes from the head down to the heart. I remember my great-grandmother I won't tell you her name and then you won't know which side of the family. But I remember my great-grandmother. And I wasn't there, but my mom and my brother were and maybe some others I don't remember. But they were visiting great-grandma in the assisted living retirement place where she was living. She was um, about 101, maybe 102 years old. And they went to visit her. And as they chit-chatted for a bit, the conversation shifted. And she shared with, her, with them the deep burden of her soul. As a young girl, I don't know, 18, 19, I don't know how old she was when this happened, her boyfriend got her pregnant out of wedlock. It's not so shameful in society now, but it was very much then. Thing is, after he got her pregnant, he immigrated to the new world. But it was a different world than nowadays, so when they found out she was pregnant, he got a letter, not a phone call, he, he got a letter. You need to come home. You've got responsibilities here. But the fact for my great-grandma, the fact that she had broken God's command in this way, that she had entered into those kinds of relations with a man outside of marriage, had weighed on her heart and mind all her life long. Do you remember? In actual, in actual living, however, not so easy to persuade oneself that by grace alone, we obtain the forgiveness of sins and peace with God. That's what she's wrestling with. It can be challenging to have the gospel move from head to heart so that the heart begins to sing and there's cheerful confidence. And what were those other things in that list? Uh, boldness and assurance and and uh, courage and all of those things, it can be challenging. But you see, what we must know, what we must know is that in concrete terms, in concrete terms that are as, just as real as the sin itself, in concrete terms, our sin, my sin, your sin has really been dealt with. It's really been dealt with. That's the thing we need to know. And that's exactly what Paul goes on to tell us. He goes on to tell us that God has, has done just that, that God has dealt with sin in terms just as real, in fact, more real and more powerful than the sin itself. Where sin abounds, grace all the more. God has dealt with our sins. Let's read... Uh, Let's read through again, 23 and 24, on to verse 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, 
whom God displayed. Now here's the element where God concretely deals with human sin. It's not just in his mind, not just uh, some abracadabra that he speaks, uh, not even, oh, I forgive you without any foundation. No, he concretely deals with human sin. God displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Paul's working down a, a particular angle here. And what, he, what is implied, but what hasn't been explicitly stated, is that on the cross of Christ, sin was acknowledged for all that it is. Christ, in essence, said, My Father, I'm taking the sins of the world upon myself, and this is what the sins of the world deserve. They deserve your full and final judgment. And so in this discussion here where Paul says that God needs to be just and at the same time the justifier of the ungodly, do you see how this fits together? Sin had to be judged. God couldn't just wave a magic stick and say, oh, all forgiven. No, he took concrete action against human sin and he judged your sin. It's not that he just says, I forgive you, and your sin remains untouched. He judged your sin. He punished your sin already in Jesus Christ. It's taken care of. It's really dealt with. It would be like having a debt in the bank. And someone comes and says to you, oh, well, your debt's been forgiven. You can, maybe you don't know that person very well. Maybe, maybe you're not sure you can trust them. Are you going to be confident your debt's forgiven? You probably won't be confident until you go down to the bank and you actually look at the ledger and you see zero. You see, that's just what God has done in Christ. He took the whole ledger of debt upon himself and he canceled it all out by taking the just punishment of God, the just wrath of God against human sin. He took it all into himself. And he dealt with it. He met it. He, he, he finished it. He, 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 he brought a power greater than sin over against sin and he wiped it out. That's what has been done. That's what has been accomplished. And we need to know that when we're struggling in our conscience which, with, with remembrance of failings, with, with the, uh, the understanding, oh, I, I, I've, I've done this and that, and I can look back through my life and I can see all the places I failed him. I need to know that he has dealt with these things concretely in Christ that it's not just hocus pocus, that it's more than abracadabra, that it has truly been dealt with and my sins are gone. Can you grasp that? Can we grasp that? We need the Holy Spirit to even grasp it, that our sins are gone. The shame, the guilt, it is gone. The debt is gone not because we did anything, but because he acted and he moved on our behalf. And it's because of that that God is able to be both just and merciful. No other way that you could hold those two things together. How can you be merciful against a sinner unless the sin has concretely been dealt with? but it has been dealt with. He took it into himself, so now he can extend mercy to you, and you can stand in his presence as if you had never sinned, fully acquitted, clean before him. He's going to present you holy and blameless, not on your own, in Christ. You lean into the Christ with all your need, and you stand in the Christ, and he will present you I love the passage in Hebrews where he says, let's see if I can remember it. He says that uh, Jesus will say in heaven, here am I, Father, and the children that you have given me. 
Here am I and the children you have given me. Oh, by grace. Let me read you another quote from Luther. You see, we've got to take hold of this thing. It's true, it's done, it's established, but we have to take hold of it. It is the only solution to our burdens of shame and guilt. It's the only solution. Don't fall into the game of trying to polish up your life. Yes, we want to obey, but we obey out of gospel freedom. We obey out of gospel freedom, not out of the sense that we still have some debt to pay. No, we obey in freedom because he has, he has forgiven. He has established me in Christ. He has made me his. My sins have been dealt with. They're gone. We obey out of this freedom. And so we need to take hold of this. Here's, here's Luther again. You will readily grant. You know, we'll all acknowledge. You know, again, the head knowledge. You will readily grant that Christ gave himself for the sins of Peter, Paul, and others who seem to us worthy of such grace. But feeling low yourself, you find it hard to believe that Christ gave himself for your sins. Our feelings shy at a personal application of the pronoun our. And we refuse to have anything to do with God until we have made ourselves worthy by good deeds. The dead end road. You'll never reach the end of it. Oh, but, but we need to lean into this, to lean into this truth that we've been looking at this morning and take hold of it. We've got to take hold of it. We, we want to be done with self-attempted solutions. We want to be done with self-justifications, with self-redemptions. In the face of your guilt, in the face of your shame, look into the things which he has done. This great act of God, look into it, study it, pray over it, ask him to show you what he has done for you and what it means for you. And seek him in this way until the glorious fact becomes real to you that your sin has been dealt with and that all its great burden is gone, not because of something you did, but because of what He in great love has done for you. So now I want to, I, I got into Luther this week. I want, to I want to close with one more quote from Luther. It's a really short one, but it, it sums up the whole of what I've tried to say. Listen to this. Either sin is with you, lying on your shoulders, or it is lying on Christ, the Lamb of God. Now, if it is lying on your back, you are lost. But if it is resting on Christ, you are free, and you will be saved. Now choose what you want. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, if our vision has become dim, if we've imperceptibly, subtly been drawn back into attempts to save ourselves, oh, Lord, help us. Open our eyes again to the glory of who you are and what you have done and may we find happy refuge in it. In your name we pray, amen.